good afternoon. Unfortunately, in my 10 minutes, I cannot address the Stantec Intrinsic uh, Report, though there are many statements and assertions I strongly disagree with. Instead, I must speak to the review which Dr. Kaz saw from Dr. Copes from Public Health Ontario. In his paper, Dr. Copes looked at the long-term I have chronic exposures to PM2.5, and he focused on only that pollutant. And he looked at the annual average concentrations of PM2.5. He clarified for us during the break that when he said he concurs with Dr. Lesbia Smith's assessment, um, it was with respect to PM2.5 only, only that one pollutant out of those hundreds of pollutants that will be emitted. During the EA process, it was identified to this council and to the MOE that there were problems with the EA risk characterization of PM2.5, which used air standards, which are not health-based, to assess risk. I also repeatedly brought forward the fact that the EA methodology did not assess PM2.5 as a non-threshold pollutant, and PM2.5 is recognized as a non-threshold pollutant by most regulatory agencies. Dr. Cope's report confirms that these concerns are valid stating, and I quote, while for compliance purposes, comparison of predicted PM2.5 concentrations with targets or standards may be helpful, it doesn't give much insight into how large or small the potential health impacts may be, end quote. As that was the approach used in the EA for PM2.5, then the EA risk assessment approach did not sufficiently assess health impacts. And since that is the intent of a risk assessment, this, to me, means the risk assessment was flawed. Dr. Copes then used a different approach, which takes into account increased risk with increased exposure by using a slope factor. He uses a slope factor taken from a World Health Organization document, which uses a slope factor with mortality, i.e. death, due to respiratory or cardiovascular disease uh, for PM2.5, PM increasing by 6% for every 10 microgram per, per cubic meter increase in ambient air concentrations of PM2.5. That this methodology was used is very good. This is the methodology that is appropriate, as opposed to Stantec's concentration ratio methodology and their minimal loading analysis argument, which is a specious argument, which my dad will speak to later. Um, my only comment here is that the slope factor used by Dr. Copes is less stringent than what is used in the Canadian Medical Association's NICAP ICAP-3 model. From the ICAP-3 2008 model, the increased percent risk of annual premature mortality for chronic exposure to 10 micrograms per cubic meter PM2.5 is 11%, which is almost half, uh, sorry, which is almost twice um, 6% that was used by Dr. Copes. The ICAP-3 model, the Canadian Medical Association model, has been verified by the huge U.S. EPA's Integrated Science Assessment for Particulate Matter. I am able to verify the, in, the values in Table 1 of Dr. Cope's report. However, I respectfully state with a high degree of confidence that uh, I believe a very significant oversight was made in drawing his conclusions. After calculating the annual additional number of deaths per 100,000 people, that is, the additional deaths expected per year as a result of the project, I believe uh, he, he did not multiply I, by the number of years the facility operates to determine the project risk. I believe his conclusion is based on values that would be out by a factor of 30, since the lifetime risk evaluation is missing. If Dr. Copes had multiplied the expected additional deaths per year by the number of years the facility operates, then under normal operation, the project risk would be between 3 to 18 additional deaths per 1 million. In Ontario, the acceptable level of risk is 1 in a million. So this means the project risk is over the Ontario criterion by 3 to 18 times for normal operation. So this project would pose an unacceptable risk. The results, of course, would be even higher for the process of that case. I am confident the conclusion of this, re this report, I'm saying I have a high degree of confidence since 
for a couple of reasons. From one, from a simple mathematical unit analysis, the lifetime project risk must be calculated by multiplication of the increased deaths per year by the number of years. And two, I have been able to verify Dr. Cope's table numbers using what I have read in the Canadian Medical Association document and by following calculations which are done using the same approach using the ICAP model in Oakville. And in Oakville, they definitely used the small factors he did, came up with the figures he did, but then they multiplied by the number of years of operation of the facility. And that's what's missing here. Now, speaking to Dr. Kyle's own report, one, there's an error in Dr. Kyle's point 16. As in stating the additional death values, he is missing two very critical words, those being per year. Stated as it is, it falsely represents Dr. Cope's report. Secondly, Dr. Kyle makes no statement on safety in his report. Counselors must insist that there is a written opinion whether the facility at this site, at this site, would be safe for germ residents. I'm emphasizing at this site because this is very important. Read the language carefully in the Stantec report. It is carefully crafted. Stantec states that, and I quote, that exposure to facility-related air emissions will not result in adverse health effects. This facility is not operated in a vacuum. The important question is, is this facility located at this site safe? Accountability is at stake and every word matters. Finally, returning to Dr. Cope's report, he cautions, as we did years ago, that, quote, standard risk assessment outputs may not always provide useful decision criteria for accepting or rejecting proposed facilities, end quote. He goes on to say, and I quote, it is important to verify that a facility is needed, cited optimally, and that the emissions are controlled to the greatest extent feasible. Applying those to the Durham York project, one, is it needed? No, there are better alternatives. Two, is it cited optim optimally? Clearly not. Three, are emissions controlled to the greatest extent possible? Clearly no. I have brought forward the Brampton emissions data that shows that it, that's better than the Covanti guarantees. We have maximum achievable control technology, not best available technology, as was advised by Health Canada for PM 2.5. The monitoring is inadequate to protect health. Our worst fears were confirmed when we read the C of A approval. Only five combustion gases will be monitored continuously. The pollutants of greatest concern, PM 2.5, mercury, cadmium, lead, will only be checked once a year during a prearranged stack test. And there are other problems with the monitoring and with the Stantec updated assessment, but I am close to out of time, and I hope you'll ask me about both of them. In summary, I will close with my opinion, which is based on the error I identified with the risk evaluation. Because the necessary due diligence was not applied during the EA process, Durham submitted and received approval for building an incinerator with an incomplete emissions inventory, and which now, with a more appropriate risk methodology applied, shows that there is an unacceptable risk to its residents. If you go to proceed with this project, you will be doing so with proper, without proper consideration and due diligence to your residents. This has potential ethical and legal ramifications. Please do not vote to accept the co-owner's agreement today as it grants authority to issue the notice to proceed. You must take the time to do your due diligence and be absolutely clear on the health risks and the financial risks and address the concerns brought forward today. At the very least, you must table this decision to another time after appropriate and thorough consideration, and you must ask off, request Dr. Kopp for a corrected report with a medical opinion on the safety of this facility at this site. And I thank you for your consideration. Any questions, Councilor Emma? Just a point of clarification. You talked about um, in reference to mortality rates, and you said that they didn't do it. Um, times the number of years that the facility is available. I'm confused because the mortality rate is per year. That's right. So why would we then times it by 25 years if the acceptable rate is zero point uh, is one in, one in a million and ours is zero point two? 
I just need you to clarify because I'm not sure why they should have added um, an extra multiplication for the 25 years since Ontario's uh, risk assessment is based on one year. No, Ontario's risk criterion is based on, it's a one in a million lifetime risk. And the lifetime of this facility is 30 years. So you have to take the additional number of deaths expected due to the facility per year, that's that 0.02 that you're referring to, and you have to multiply that by the number of years. And the, the, the per year part, I, I know Councillor Rodriguez um, asked the question that, I'm just, uh, that I, I pointed to here, that why you need to multiply by 30. And the answer that was given by Dr. Coates, as I understand it, is that he said that that was built into this, the slope factor, um, the, the World Health Organization's slope factor. Um, I, I had an opportunity to talk with Dr. Coates afterward, and I questioned him on that, and I still disagree. Um, I, and I, pointed, I, I pointed out to him that the per year part uh, in the calculation does not come from the World Health Organization slope factor. The per year part comes because you, you multiply by Durham's, that like their Statistics Canada has mortality tables, I, I have the, the actual table, and I didn't, don't have it here today, but for Durham and all the other areas in Ontario, you know your mortality rate per 100,000 per year. That's where the per year part comes in. So when you build that all in together, what comes out in the risk is you've got, as Dr. Cope says, and I verified his numbers there, I don't have it. I don't disagree with the numbers he has there. You come up with additional deaths um, per year expected from this uh, increase in PM 2.5 concentrations. So the additional deaths per year has to be multiplied by the numbers of years. And just from a mathematical uh, perspective, that's it's a straight analysis calculation to come up with the actual number of additional deaths per 100,000. And then, because Ontario, is, uh, their risk criterion is based on deaths per million, you have to take the deaths per 100,000 and just convert it to an equivalent fraction of 1 million. And that's where um, it turns out to be between 3 and 18 additional deaths <coughs> Per million, um, and um, that's for normal operation. So it gets worse for, for the process upset scenario. And the Ontario uh, regulatory criterion is one in a million uh, lifetime risk. So you're stating that the risk assessment that we received from the professionals uh, and the, the consultants that were hired. Is inaccurate. Because I'm just confused between what he had said and what you had said. I'm saying I don't disagree with his, his table values, and he's clearly stated if you read above, it says annual. Um, so his table values, I completely agree with. It's the conclusion that I disagree with, um, where he, uh, where Dr. Copes says that this is. Um, less than the regulatory criterion, um, I believe it is more than the regulatory criterion because he did not multiply by the number of years that the facility is operating. And that was done. I, I know the calculation. I have it here. Uh, for when, they, uh, when the Oakville uh, generating station was reviewed, um, they used the, the, the only difference is the only difference I understand is that they used, a, he used the WHO benchmarks, um, the WHO, not benchmark, the WHO um, slope factor, and there they used the Canadian Medical Association ICAP model.